welcome you all on this afternoon to our panel discussion, uh, which is sponsored by the uh, Berkeley Center, the Center for German European Studies, and the Kutzalbu uh, and Kalal Center for our Muslim Christian Understanding. Some of you may have seen from the little bag, it has some Italian salami and crackers and orange juice because I was at a program and people in Iceland gave me something to eat at that lunch. So if things get boring, I'll simulate how I think we have some salami and to bring the sense of the effort. Um, we're, de we're delighted to have this panel today, and uh, I have two colleagues here, Dr. Catherine Marshall and uh, Shannon Lutris. Um, I'll tell you their backgrounds. And then we'll get into the program rather than uh, doing it uh, sort of sequentially. Catherine Marshall is a senior fellow at Georgetown's Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs, <coughs> and visiting professor in the Department of Government. She is also a senior advisor for the World Bank. A long career with the World Bank from 1971 to 2006 involved a wide range of leadership assignments, many focused on Africa. From 2000 to 2006, her mandate covered ethics, values, and faith in development work as counselor for the World Bank's president. Ms. Marshall is a core group member of the Council of 100, an initiative of the World Economic Forum to advance understanding between the Islamic world and the West, also of the Council on Foreign Relations. She's been closely engaged in the creation and development of the World Faiths Development Dialogue. Sharon Ladris is acting director of the Secretariat of the Alliance of Civilizations at the UN. Uh, without his presence, uh, the Alliance would have never accomplish uh, uh, what it did accomplish. Before joining the Alliance, Mr. Ladris served as senior advisor to the Council of 100 Leaders, West Islamic World Dialogue Initiative at the World Economic Forum and continues to serve on the steering committee of that initiative. I'm pleased to think this sounds very incestuous. All three of us are on the C100. I hadn't thought about that. So we can share something in common, however much we may differ in this discussion. From 2000 to 2004, Mr. Adri served as Chief Operating Officer of Search for Common Ground, an international conflict resolution organization pioneering the use of media for conflict transformation. Before that, Mr. Adri managed Searches U.S. Iran proper, program, an effort to improve cultural relations. He serves on the boards of several nonprofit organizations and is a member of the Young Global Leaders Forum of the World Economic Forum. Um, I am director of the uh, Prince Albert Lee Center for Muslim Christian Understanding. Um, I, too, am a member of the World Economic Forum C100, and I uh, was a member of the high level group of the uh, United Nations. Uh, alliance of Civilizations, so that's why I'm here. Um, I think perhaps the uh, best way to to go would be to start with the channel, and then we'll move down a lot. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for being here on a bizarrely nice day. The whole winter has been bizarre. Um, I'll just talk for, I don't think the whole thing will we'll see. I'm going to give you a little bit of background of the Alliance of Civilizations at the United Nations, how it got started, uh, what happened over the past year, uh, and where things are going next. Uh, the Alliance was originally the idea of Prime Minister Zapatero of Spain. Uh, he brought the idea to Secretary General, then Secretary General of the UN, uh, Kofi Annan, uh, who thought it was an excellent idea, offered to house it at the UN, and said it would be very important, though, to get a Muslim partner government uh, with the Spanish, supporting this essentially model of the Alliance bring about more generally. Uh, and with that, they approached uh, Prime Minister Erdogan of Turkey. And it's for that reason that the Spanish and Turkish governments have co-sponsored this initiative. Um, the idea for the alliance from the start has been, uh, and what the uh, Secretary General formed this high-level group to do, is to identify and analyze the factors that are fomenting, uh, feeding, polarization, uh, and extremism in relations between Muslim and Western societies and to develop a practical action plan of what to do about this phenomenon, how to counter these trends. Uh, the high-level group was made up of 20 people that the Secretary General appointed uh, or invited to join. Uh, Professor Esposito was one of them. Uh, some of the more household names were Archbishop Tutu, um, uh, President Katsumi, former President Katsumi of Iran. Uh, the Sheikh of Qatar, Sheikh Sheikh Moza of Qatar was there. Karen Armstrong, many of you probably read her books. Uh, and the former foreign ministers of Indonesia and France, the former prime minister of Senegal, 
It was a very eminent group, primarily political, uh, academic, and religious leaders uh, from around the world. Uh, and my office was established to support this group of 20 in developing this report that you have before you. If you didn't see it, there are copies of it out on the, uh, uh, out in the lobby area when you go out. Um, now, the report was produced by the group of 20 and delivered to the Secretary General in November of last year. And he, in turn, delivered it to an informal meeting of the UN General Assembly, a very heavily attended session, actually, in December. But one of the last things he did, uh, in fact, was to present the report to them. And where things are right now is that the new uh, UN Secretary General, uh, Ban Ki-moon, uh, is consulting with governments uh, and awaiting my office uh, to uh, produce an implementation plan. So she had to take the recommendations from this report and get them going over the next year and beyond. Uh, so the, I'm going to just cover in a nutshell what the report says you have for you. Uh, and as Professor Esposito is a member of the high level group, I'm sure he will, uh, he will add later because that makes it easy that he felt this report. Um, uh, the report essentially starts with the premise that uh, this entire so called Islamic Western relationship is playing out in a global context that's very important to understand. And it's a global context that goes beyond what many of us talk about a great deal uh, and know about a great deal, which is the growing sort of gap between so-called haves and have-nots. So this is something that's going on in the world that's very important. But superimposed on that uh, is a growing perception in much of the world uh, that double standards are at play in terms of how international law uh, is invoked uh, and enforced, when it is and when it is not. And that these double standards, these perceived double standards in the application of international law and human rights standards are fomenting extraordinary resentment uh, around the world, particularly towards the United States, but more generally towards the more powerful countries in the world. Uh, the perception, whether one agrees with it or not, is that um, uh, the taking of innocent lives, uh, the breaking of uh, certain human rights norms, uh, the use of torture, uh, arbitrary detention, uh, even how one approaches the enforcement of the Nuclear Proliferation Treaty that some countries essentially get a pass or uh, don't have to abide by every aspect of the treaty, and others are uh, expected not only to abide by it, but to go beyond. The, the group did not take a position that, you know, on NTT, for instance, the Nuclear Proliferation Treaty, um, uh, that this country should be allowed to have a nuclear weapon, this country shouldn't, or anything like that. The point that the group made, I think, in identifying this larger global context is that the frustration and the resentment over the double standards used, wherever one's position is really growing in the world, and has caused a great deal of resentment for the more powerful countries, and a perception that um, rule of law generally has been undercut. And so, um, you know, what may seem like a very basic call was really put in very moral terms in the report by the high-level group of plea for a return to uh, respect for multilateral approaches to differences and for respect for the institutions that establish international norms and those that should be set up uh, to help enforce them. Now, within that, uh, that sort of global context, the group talked about where this is playing out, the sense of resentment and double standards is playing out in the most acute terms. And that's really in relations between Muslim and Western societies uh, around the world. Uh, and the group really identified a, a couple things as feeding, um, feeding this resentment. Um, the first is the notion that um, um, military and political interventions, interventions, particularly from the West and predominantly Muslim countries, have fomented a great deal of resentment. Um, the most symbolic conflict that was identified in the report is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, where there's a lot of uh, perception in many uh, Muslim societies that the way in which the most powerful countries, particularly the United States, are dealing with that conflict is not even-handed, um, and that it's perpetuating the injustice. And that that conflict has sort of taken on, a, a, as important as it is to the people living it, it's taken on a symbolic, symbolic importance well beyond you know, its geographic border, so that um, particularly for Jews and Muslims, but not just for Jews and Muslims, but particularly for Jews and Muslims around the world, uh, even those who may never visit uh, that region, it has taken on incredible importance as a symbolic value that people attach great importance to. So people, uh, uh, the extremes are really formed around, around opinions about that conflict. Um, but there are others as well in Iraq, in particular Afghanistan and Iraq, or in particular, but particularly the Iraqi situation is now, what people are seeing in many Muslim countries, um, is fomenting a great deal of, of this kind of resentment in a sense that, um, which many of you probably already know, that in, 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 in many Muslim societies around the world, the popular belief is that the war on terrorism is in fact the war on Islam. But that's basically how people perceive it, and how they're living it, and how they, they understand uh, what's going on. And things like um, uh, statements by some political and religious leaders 
that are taken to be very anti-Islamic in the Muslim world are then attached to the political and military interventions as further evidence that there is this anti-Islamic um, uh, campaign stemming from the West. Uh, whatever one may think of uh, either the Pope's remarks, the Danish cartoons, and the reactions to those events, uh, the light from which those events were seen very much tied to what, what is seen to be a global war on Islam uh, by many Muslims. And so these things are very much tied to one another uh, in, in the perception. The other factors going on, in addition to the sort of military and political interventions, uh, is what's happening within Muslim societies. Uh, and within Muslim societies, the group identified as a real uh, context between what you might call progressive and regressive forces, what the report calls progressive and regressive forces, on a whole range of social and political issues. And that uh, people oftentimes misunderstand that context as being between progressive secular and uh, regressive religious forces. And it's simply not that, uh, not that happened by and not that simple. Um, uh, that there are many both religious and secular forces in Muslim societies that are both on what you might call the progressive end of this, of this scale and, and, and some on both sides that may be called progressive. Um, uh, the Taliban was very so-called religious, Saddam Hussein was very so-called secular. Um, and the group essentially made the point that how this contest plays out between these progressive and regressive forces in, in Muslim societies is going to have an impact obviously not only on their own communities but on the world at large. And that there isn't a whole lot that Western uh, governments can necessarily do with regard to how that's going to play out. But there certainly are things that should be avoided. Um, and the kinds of things that should be avoided um, are the sort of false hitting of, of secular versus religious. Uh, and the group even uh, uh, goes so far to say that, that how the media portrays these events and gives the example of taking the most extreme voices from Muslim societies on the one hand and sort of the most extreme anti-Islamic voices on the other side and putting those as the debate points that many see uh, in the media is not helpful uh, to this process. Um, and feeding into what's happening within Muslim societies, and the final thing that I'll mention is uh, why we perceive failure right on the, on the part of, of Muslim governments to provide for the people in terms of development, education, a whole range of socioeconomic uh, and, and political um, uh, issues. Um, and one point that the group makes is that for many Muslims, and particularly in the Middle East region, uh, for many Muslims perceiving the Middle East region, the only so-called successes in people's minds, again, not stating necessarily the views of the group, but the only successes in people's minds of uh, Muslim parties that have successfully resisted or pushed out uh, Western intervention and political and military domination are non-governmental political religious movements, political religious military movements. The Mujahideen, uh, essentially keeping the Soviet Union out of Afghanistan, uh, the Ayatollah coming to power in Iran uh, through who, uh, and kicking out the Western-supported American and British-supported uh, Shah. Uh, uh, and in Lebanon, how power people perceive of that conflict? Hezbollah now being perceived as twice having been successful at pushing Israel out, out of Lebanon. And when one looks at you know, the last several decades, those are the only things that really people see as successful pushes back against uh, military and political domination. It becomes clearer why um, the governments uh, have so little support and are viewed uh, to be so um, uh, weak. Uh, and why many, it's one of the factors that causes many of the political, uh, religious, and military movements to, to, to strengthen. Um, now, when the group then moved to recommendations, they have really political recommendations and, um, and, and a whole range of recommendations of what they call, might call the social cultural appeal. And it made the point that because the it makes the point that because the political issues are so central, um, in fact, if there's one message that the report puts out, and it was what was most covered by the media when the report came out in November, it's that the causes of this rift between Muslim and Western societies are not primarily cultural or religious in nature. So we have different religious values or different cultures. They're primarily political in nature. And if we don't deal, if the global community does not deal with the political differences, particularly the political conflicts, and especially Israel, Palestine, um, uh, Iraq, and Afghanistan, for instance, it's going to be very difficult for all the well-meaning, uh, good intention, cross-cultural exchanges, education initiatives, media initiatives, to make much of a dent. Uh, because those kinds of efforts can get quite easily wiped out by yet another military engagement or whatever it might be. And so the group said it's incredibly important to deal on the political end. And yet the group was also aware that the alliance, uh, although a political initiative, the high level group members were not going to solve the Iraq problem in Afghanistan or the problem with the Israel Palestine problem. So it's really a plea 
sort of main engagement, first and foremost, on the Israeli Palestinian conflict. And the one you know, concrete recommendation in that area that the group made as a contribution to uh, the other uh, uh, efforts that may be underway in that regard with regard to that conflict is the development of a white paper on the Israeli Palestinian conflict that would really give voice to the different historical narratives that Israelis and Palestinians have about the major events in their history and what's led to this conflict. Um, the very different historical narratives that people have about why peace processes have failed uh, in the past. And that would be valuable to have as an example Israeli and Palestinian voices essentially collaborating on a white paper that would not reconcile the different views, because that was deemed probably impossible, but at least present and acknowledge that they exist and that those different narratives uh, run through everything from the beginning of this conflict through to why did Oslo fail and, and everything that's happening today. Um, the group moved from that to part two of the report. Now, part one, all that analysis and this recommendation on the Israeli Palestinian conflict, we're looking at the political level. And part two of the report is really uh, focused on what the group identified as a, as a problem that's come about. This issue, while mostly political in nature, <coughs> has now seeped into the hearts and minds of people at the popular level. That people actually do believe in many uh, societies, both in predominantly Muslim countries and in uh, Europe and the United States, that there are such core differences between us at the value level of, you know, that, uh, uh, that those core differences are explained or used to explain conflicts. Uh, of all kinds. And the group identified that in order to deal with that reality, uh, one must mobilize on key fronts. And the four that they identified were really media, youth mobilization, education, and migration. Um, and with, I'm not going to go into the details with you of all the projects. I'm happy to sort of react in the Q&A with the questions that people have about them. Uh, but they are all meant to essentially reinforce the notion that has been subverted mostly by extremes on all sides of this conflict. Um, that both historically and today in reality, these are not two worlds uh, destined for conflict with one another, or even with deep-seated historical uh, uh, animosity that, that necessarily has to be in conflict with one another. That in fact, uh, cultures do not evolve uh, in a mutually exclusive way, not to not with one another, but they overlap, they constantly borrow and feed into one another, and that this is the reality between uh, Muslim, Western, Muslim, Christian, and Jewish societies throughout history. Uh, and that the initiatives suggested under each of those four key areas would help reinforce that and make that real today. Um, and if you could sort of name kind of one catch-off for how you might take all the recommendations in part two, it's really to strengthen the density of the interconnectedness, the partnerships, the organizational level partnerships, uh, the partnerships between public and private entities in um, Muslim societies and in Western societies um, for mutual benefit and other mutual interest. Now, the mechanism for taking this all forward, I remember, is the uh, uh, report suggests that the Secretary General do a couple of things. One is identify a high representative, somebody to essentially oversee the implementation of the recommendations in the report, but also someone who could assist the Secretary General at the Secretary General's behest to engage and help manage conflicts that come up, particularly at the intersection of religion and politics. The group identified that a lot is going on at the intersection of religion and politics, that the media is having an awful time explaining whether it's happening here in the United States, so-called religious right, or it's happening in Muslim societies, or in Israel, or wherever it may be, uh, and that the conflicts that are coming up at the intersection of religion and politics uh, really need to be better understood and better managed. And the cartoon controversy and the, the folks' remarks and reactions to both those events were just a couple of the main events that happened during the course of the HLG, the high level groups, deliberations that pointed this out. So this high representative could be a useful resource to help um, mediate and engage in, in, in managing and resolving those conflicts. Um, and then the final piece uh, would be really the establishment of a regular forum. Well, sort of along the lines of the Clinton Global Initiative, which some of you may know, but a forum where governments, civil society actors, businesses, religious leaders, people active in the field of trying to reconcile these communities could meet regularly uh, once a year, make commitments to one another, and it would be a very action-oriented forum. And the Spanish government has already uh, offered to host the first one of these in the fall of this year. So that's where things are, and uh, my office is now going through all the recommendations in the second part, reaching out to a number of universities, uh, businesses, uh, multilateral organizations, uh, uh, to identify which projects they're interested in moving together with the alliance and, and how to prioritize them. And we'll be presenting that to the Secretary General in about a month, month and a half. And then it'll really be up to him how he's going to take them forward. Uh, 
because I think Shannon's presented very well what the Alliance did. Um, and so I, I see my role as twofold. One, to provide a kind of context for what the Alliance uh, did, and then later on in the discussion to speak as a member of a high level group in terms of any questions that come up about the way in which it was conducted, etc. One point I would make, which is very obvious, but you should be aware of anyway, is that when you read a report such as this, you know, some people will say things like, um, it didn't go far enough, why didn't you do X or Y? But one of the things you want to remember is that uh, this is basically a report that at the end of the day, however uh, much we differ, you're moving towards some kind, some kind of acceptable consensus report. And so there were members of the HLG who felt <coughs> that, uh, that the report should have uh, moved beyond where it was on some issues. Uh, and uh, there, there were differences. Uh, I think uh, it was uh, one of the most uh, spirited uh, uh, groups I've ever been associated with, also one of the most uh, frustrating, to be honest. Uh, but in any case, uh, we all wound up making it to the end without resigning ahead of time. Uh, but one just wants to be a realist, because I've had people come up and sort of say, gee, you know, you didn't go all the way, or gee, so-and-so's on the committee, and I know he or she believes in this, but I don't see it reflected uh, in the report. Now, to kind of contextualize a bit the alliance and, and, and the, the context that the alliance is speaking to, let me begin with a couple of observations in terms of the world that the alliance was responding to. If you consider the following, number one, that uh, Islam is the second largest in the world's religions today. Um, and in 30 years, it's gone from being invisible to being the second or third largest in Europe and America. And, and what the implications of globalization really are uh, in that kind of world, not just this fact, but the fact that we now live in a globalized world. And so whether it's a matter of uh, uh, the Muslim world and the West uh, engaging each other constructively, the fact is there really isn't the Muslim world in the West. There's a variety of levels you could argue about that. But Muslims are in the West in significant ways. And so from a kind of demographic point of view, from a point of view of uh, both uh, domestic realities, but also world citizenship, but also in terms of even dealing with issues of global terrorism. Globalization is very much there. Globalization itself, while being a positive, is also, is also an issue when it comes to the way in which uh, the world is evolving, the grievances that people have, political, economic, and cultural. What the Alliance had to deal with also is a kind of uh, momentum that was built up before 9-11. After the fall of the Soviet Union, one of the issues that did emerge was where's the next global threat? Uh, the international, uh, for most people who grew up, there was a sense that when you look at international politics, they had grown up in a, in, in a world in which there was a Cold War, in a world in which there was very clearly a kind of us and them at a global level. And some of you will remember that after that, there were concerns from an economic point of view that the challenge would come from Japan or from Europe. And, <coughs> excuse me, and, and, and for others, seeing what went on in Iran and Lebanon, one began to see a literature develop, a literature that talked in the words of Bernard Lewis uh, in his Roots of Muslim Rage, um, or uh, uh, Samuel Huntington, uh, began to speak of one of a clash of civilizations. And the question was, is it inevitable? Do we have it? And there were those who basically said that Islam was the new global threat, political, civilizational, and demographic. Uh, I remember the day that I signed a contract to write a book that I call The Islamic Threat, Myth, or Reality, which I wrote in light of the, uh, the, uh, the Gulf War of 1990 I was asked to brief an assistant secretary of state. And uh, when I went up to brief him, I talked about the fact, I was briefing him on North Africa, and uh, I said, talk to him about the fact that you know, one had to be careful about jumping to the conclusion that there was this kind of global monolithic global threat. And he said, of course, I, you know, I don't believe in that. But then proceeded to say things like, well, you know, Islam is the only ideological global alternative. Or, gee, do you think Algeria will be another Iran? And so those ideas were out there. But also the idea that it was a demographic threat. Uh, the realization, uh, as Pat Buchanan uh, put in an article, that while their co-religionists are humiliating us, I think he said, in places like Iran and Lebanon, uh, in Europe and America, uh, uh, Muslims are uh, not only present, but growing at a, at, a, at, a, at, a, uh, at a great rate. He uh, used the example of Germany, where he said in Germany, where, uh, in a sense, uh, your indigenous Germans are uh, more secular and have small families. Uh, at the same time, they are going to Turkish physicians uh, to have abortions, 
and the Turkish physicians are not only performing the abortions, but also the Turkish physicians are having families of six and eight. So the kind of demographic threat. He had this great phrase in the West where condom is king. Only a Georgetown graduate could, of course, come up with that phrase. <laughs> but in any case, uh, I used to say at the Holy Cross, where I talked before, they said we only had the, the Holy Cross, the, the Crusaders on every image you can imagine, with the sweaters for babies, etc. And the only thing people used to say, is there any object as they went through the store where you won't see a Crusader? And I'd say, yeah, you won't see a condom with a Crusader on it. Okay. <laughs> at least not so. Uh, um, all right, now against that background, some other things were happening. Uh, before 9-11, you had President Cotton be elected in Iraq, and he had his famous interview with Cristiano Monopor, in which, in addition to discussing geopolitics, this, this new president of Iraq, um, he, in fact, called for a dialogue of civilizations. He demonstrated a positive knowledge and appreciation of the West, and also identified differences between the Iran and between the Muslim world and the West, but called for a dialogue of civilizations. Um, the United Nations also um, bought into that idea. Now, 9-11 comes along. <clears throat> this is my third presentation of the day, so I'm sorry. <clears throat> I'm talking about six hours. Um, there have been many initiatives in response to 9-11. The Alliance is not the only, uh, not the only, um, well, they sound like thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> very good. Uh, <laughs> or as they said to me in Kuwait, when, I, when they asked me what I did, when I, how I came up with the idea of writing the Islamic threat. And I said, well, at the end of the day, what my wife and I do, we do regularly, which is to have a martini. And when the talk was over, I talked to about 300 Islamist-oriented professionals. One of them said, terrific talk, it's so good to see you, and I hope that the next time you come, you will have learned to enjoy the wonders of camel's milk. And <laughs> five o'clock. But in any case, I like camel's milk, but still, not a live alternative. Um, but when we look at 9-11, it's not just the alliance as an initiative to respond. You had the World Economic Forum's Council of 100 Leaders, which is a, a, a putting together 100 religious, political, media leaders to look at the issue of the growth of extremism, to look at the intercivilizational dialogue uh, in, in order to kind of head off uh, concerns about a clash of civilizations. Uh, you had Club Madrid. Uh, addressing after the Madrid bombings, putting together an international conference on terrorism and how to address terrorism. Uh, you, you have the OIC, you have the CESCO. Uh, believe me, in terms of intercivilizational dialogue and the, the kinds of concerns that the Alliance has, it is a global phenomenon. You can be at a conference once, twice uh, a week, any part of, in any part of the world, from New York to Jakarta, of dealing with the, uh, the subject of the interaction and dialogue. I think, though, that it's important to understand the context in which this concern occurs. And I think that uh, Chapman put his finger on it. On the one hand, we talk about a war against global terrorists, although one has to say that um, the British prefer not to use that term. In fact, just about uh, every European country, at least the, the people that I've been dealing with, really are, not, are very uncomfortable with the phrase that um, <coughs> the Americans have chosen for this. And indeed, a meeting with some senior military earlier today, they're not comfortable, but we're stuck with this notion of a war on global terrorism. However, offsetting that is a belief throughout the Muslim world, among mainstream Muslims, professionals, and government, the military, that this is a war against Islam in the Muslim world. And many see it that way. Why? The day after 9-11, a, um, a woman, mother of four, a professor at the university, uh, uh, Islamically oriented, a public intellectual who writes media, uh, uh, writes columns for the newspapers, appears uh, in TV in the Gulf, uh, emailed and said, it's terrible what happened. Uh, you surely you'll want to go after Osama bin Laden, but we wonder whether this is the beginning or the end. And when I asked her what you mean, she emailed back and said, will this become an excuse to redraw the map of the Middle East? Now, if you go and look at NewAmericanCentury.com, you will see a plan that was drawn up more than a decade ago, many of whose architects served or advised the first Bush administration. So that idea is out there. In terms of the reality on the ground and, and why you have this, this, this tension at times between the mainstream, I'm not talking about extremists here, remember the way in which our war unfolded. Uh, Secretary of State Powell said we're going after Osama, we're not going for regime change in Afghanistan. 
when Mullah Umar refused to give up Osama, then of course we went into Afghanistan and you had regime change. However, before that conflict was even resolved, we were talking about new and second frontiers and speculating on Somalia to the Philippines. We then talked about axis of evil. And we even added to those axis of evil countries a couple of more. But in fact, they were all in the island was the world with the exception of North Korea. All of those countries were countries that we thought about in terms of military action or sanctions, with the exception of North Korea. Somehow, North Korea has always been some, uh, an outfit that we think we can deal with through diplomacy. Yet, North Korea is the person with a proven nuclear capability and that has demonstrated that it, is, it feels free to test and use it. All of those things were out there. And then, Iraq, the invasion of Iraq. And subsequent talk about should we use military action with regard to Iran or with Syria, continuing right to today. We've just had uh, the action in Somalia, which has been completely covered over by everything else that's going on. But also look at the Times of London today, and you'll see an article that, that speculates on whether or not the United States, Britain, Israel, and Saudi Arabia are uh, 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 thinking about a strike against Iran and a strike that would be done by Israel rather than the U.S. doing it. This is in the Times. An article in the Israeli newspapers this week talks about the fact that senior Israeli military have been making contingency plans for an attack against Iran. Whether it's reality or perception, the point is, if it is perception for people, it's a reality. And there are enough realities on the ground, including the latest war in Lebanon, that can reinforce um, this issue. And so, there still are many who talk about the danger of a clash. One of the things we've seen is that despite a war against global terrorism, in fact, extremism has grown throughout the Muslim world. Also, anti-Americanism has grown throughout the world. And anti-Americanism is as strong in France and Germany within a matter of uh, eight percentage points as it would be in a country like Saudi Arabia or Jordan. I think that's important to, to keep in mind. Um, and so the question of whether or not this, this is a, uh, a, a whether there's a danger of a clash of civilizations, I think is very much out there. Now, let's think about the way in which that gets played out. On the one hand, Osama bin Laden and others say that there is a clash. And they argue that they, there is a clash and they want a clash. That indeed it is a, a, a fight between the forces of good and evil. On the other hand, at times, some of our leaders have tended to use that same kind of language of forces of good and evil. We recognize on the one hand positively that this is not only a war that deals with political realities, and that is, you know, what are the root causes, but that it is a war for the minds and hearts. That's used by the British, by the Americans. We talk, both America and Britain, about an ideological war, a war of ideas. It's a good idea, but there are those who spin it in a different direction. And what they wind up often arguing is that, in fact, it is an ideological war, but an ideological war that is a global ideological war. And rather than dealing with the political realities, it almost looks as if you've got the extremists uh, in the Muslim world who are calling for a global war and insisting it's based on ideology rather than issues of politics and power that get legitimated in the name of religion. But too often there are also the extremists, quote, on our side, that want to argue that it's an ideological war. And so, for example, there are those who still entertain the idea, and I've seen this in, 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 in uh, all kinds of settings, uh, that say, that do not make the distinction that President Bush makes between Islam and Muslim extremism, but say that, in fact, Islam itself is an extremist ideology. <coughs> Islam itself is an extremist ideology. I was just talking to a senior specialist for a major government agency that has been asked to argue against the notion that Islam is an extremist ideology because a number of the experts that are coming in are saying, look, it's not a matter of extremism and some Muslim extremists, extremism, the religion of Islam itself, contrary, in contrast to other religions, is itself an extremist ideology. So that issue is very much uh, out there. Um, just a couple of other observations. <clears throat> I think one of the things we have to then deal with, and I think that, that in many ways what the Alliance's bottom message was, and what the World Gallup poll, which I'll refer to in a second, its message is, is that it's primarily policy. That the, that the drivers are political, but that religion and culture frame the way in which people respond, and the way in which, uh, in particular, the way in which extremists will take religion, hijack religion, 
in order to frame, legitimate, and mobilize. And this shouldn't surprise us. Robert Papp's work on uh, suicide bombs, which looks across religions and areas of the world, uh, for Papp, it confirms the fact that the primary driver has to do with occupation, the reality or the perception. And that, in fact, religion is a secondary uh, a source for the way to frame it, so much so that even the Tamil Tigers, perhaps the greatest use, users until recently, of uh, suicide bombing as a tactic. The Tamil Tigers that are, are secular, Marxist, you name it, when convenient vis-a-vis -vis the Sinhalese in Sri Lanka, appeal to a kind of Tamil identity, which is also rooted in a sense of, a, of, of basically a kind of basic, primal, not in the negative sense, of uh, Hindu identity. And so I, I think that distinguishing out this issue of policy versus religion, uh, here I, I would refer, if you want to see this teased out a bit, uh, both analytically but also in terms of some data from the Gallup World Poll, look at the Harvard International Review, and an article uh, that I did, uh, the first part's easy to remember, I can't remember the second part. The first part is, it's the policy stupid. And then I think it's Islam and U.S. foreign policy. But that lays out not only the argument, but, but some data from a, from a Gallup poll that we deal with this. Now what do we see, and I want to end with this, in, in, in a Gallup or a poll, that, that gives hope to the kinds of initiatives that the Alliance has and to other initiatives that we need to engage in, but also gives us a, a realistic take. What we find when we look at the data is that, in fact, uh, if you ask people uh, uh, what the, uh, are in the Muslim world, this is a poll that looks at uh, and, and measures what a billion Muslims from North Africa to Southeast Asia think or believe. Okay? It's a poll that's part of the Gallup World Poll, which is a poll that will be, will be done every year for the next 100 years. So this poll is measuring what Muslims say. Not what does Esposito say, not what does Shaggy Madrid say, not what Catherine says, not what Bernard Lewis says, Stop. Uh, not what uh, Daniel Pipe says, uh, but one is able to say, gee, beyond what the experts say, this is how Muslims feel, think, and react. We can actually go and listen to what, Muslim, what Muslims have to say about this. A very intense poll, uh, and uh, you, can, you can look up the information on it, but it's not simply a poll that just talks in urban areas. It takes, it takes each of the countries done, it grids the countries in terms of urban, rural, and village, it takes a sampling of 1,000 people and, and, and gets a diverse sampling that not only uh, does it uh, in terms of where they're located, but demographically, in terms of age factors, in terms of socioeconomic factors. So that plus or minus 3%, one can say that these interviews, which are done one on one, that these interviews and the results of these interviews represent the voice of a million Muslims. When we look at it, we see that the problem that emerges is not politics. The problem, uh, I'm sorry, is politics and not culture. Uh, that the concerns of many Muslims around the world have to do with cultural disrespect, open-ended question, what do you resent most about the West? Uh, response, top response from across the Muslim world, that Islam and Muslims are equated with terrorism. Not that Muslim extremism is a problem. Moderates, radicals, all agree. By radicals here, I mean those who are not act actively engaged in violence with people who, for example, believe that 9-11 was justified. But all will say that the, the, the issue is that they are concerned about security and extremism. But their concern is that, that the way in which Europe and America approach the Muslim world is to equate Islam with terrorism. That's why the cartoon controversy was a problem. If the cartoons had been made in front of bin Laden and said bin Laden is a terrorist, but it was the Prophet Muhammad that was put in the center of it. That's why Pope Benedict's statements were a problem. If Pope Benedict had said, look, you know, violence is the major problem in the world. Let me tell you, we Catholics have a whole history of dealing with violence. We can talk about the Inquisition, the Crusades, more recent stuff, so we know about it. And you've got a problem in your area, and I'm going to name some of the problems. But for, for the Holy Father to be in a position where he's quoting somebody that at the end of the day he says he disagrees with, but basically somebody who is is actually going after Islam and the Prophet Muhammad, and also to get it wrong in citing the Quran, that occurs within a context in which mainstream Muslims are feeling, look, there's this knee-jerk reaction, and now we've got the leader of a major religion. Could it be that he also doesn't distinguish sufficiently between our religion and what extremists do? But when we, when we look at the way in which people respond, there's a great deal of hope. For example, it's not only what do Muslims present, but what do they admire? After 9-11, people said, why do they hate us? And the response of people like Bernard Lewis and
was they hate us for who we are. That's an easy one. And they hate us for who we are. Who are we? We believe in democracy, we believe in human rights, and we believe in freedom, we believe in gender equality, and then it's dot, dot, dot when it comes to the Muslim world. In other words, all the direct opposite. Okay? What do we find in the poll? We find that majorities of Muslims admire America's freedom of the press, admire America's freedoms, its technology, its ingenuity. Uh, quote from Saudi Arabia, what do you admire about the West? Freedom of the press, opinion and expression, also scientific advancement. From Iran, social justice, having access to nuclear power, and real democracy. Uh, I should tell you that President Bush's uh, 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 ratings in the United States are exactly comparable to Iran, uh, which is very interesting in terms of favor and disfavor. Um, okay, what do Pakistanis have to say? The way they work hard, that is Americans, um, it has helped them in developing their countries. Morocco, what do they admire about us? Liberty and freedom and being open-minded with each other. And yet Morocco has a high percentage uh, when it comes to anti-Americans. So the anti-Americanism is about policy. It's not that people have a problem with necessarily political participation, with capitalism, with our freedoms. It's not as if, as some naively put after 9-11, that you know, Muslims wake up in the world and say, thank God, I don't have a headache. Elections come? I have no elections. Or elections come, I already know I have to vote for it. So I don't have to be like the Americans. You know, they've got to look at the press, they've got to look at the debates, they slide easy. You know? uh, thank God I don't have to worry about competing economically. I've been poor in the developed country, and that's what Islam wants, and capitalism is terrible. And then, of course, we discover that Muslims want a lot of what we want, that they like to have that, that Lexus if they can have it, that they like to have that whatever. It's like, wait a minute, now they're going against their religion. Sort of like, you know. You know, put between a rock and a hard place in terms of responses. Um, let me end with something that I really think we need to think about. What do people talk about as a concern? People in Turkey. The West should stop its interference in our internal affairs in the name of democracy. Interfering in the name of democracy. Lebanon must change its colonization policy and bring about equality among nations instead of trying to dominate. Iran, the U.S. must stop its interference in the affairs of our country because they only think of their own benefit. Saudi Arabia, change the fact that countries in the Western world try to dominate the Islamic world rather than to include it. I'll bring you to a sobering conclusion. In this survey, we find out that both people in the Muslim world and the West live with the same myth. Each side thinks the other doesn't care. The survey shows both sides do care. But the state of difference. Both sides believe that a major problem is public relations. We don't understand each other enough. We miscommunicate. We need to respect each other and learn more about each other. That's all plus. But where many in the Muslim world differ from the West, the West stops there. Many people in the West do not touch on foreign policy. Whereas in the Muslim world, people will say, we don't want you dominating our country. We don't want you intervening in our country. And so that foreign policy component gets to be left out. Now, this is interesting in terms of the current administration. In the first Bush administration, there was a difference. The Bush administration, President Bush said that the war had to be fought in terms of military, economic, and public diplomacy. And, that, and, and, and quite rightly, the administration said, and the military will say, what the military is equipped to do is to kill, capture, contain. The military is not equipped to win a war against global terrorism. War against global terrorism is also a war of ideas or ideology. And, and that becomes an issue. Now, the Secretary of State, Colin Powell, believed that we had to engage in both public relations as public diplomacy, but also deal with foreign policy. But we never really quite addressed those foreign policy issues in the way that we needed to. So there's a hope there that both sides do see a need, a need to move forward. But the challenge is whether or not we will address, we will address those policies. I think that becomes the critical challenge. I think this is what the Alliance of Civilizations calls for, because it not only provides the kind of, if you will, political critique uh, that, uh, that Chow was talking about, but then it talks about its programs with regard to youth and education. And, and this is where you've got that kind of outreach. You've got a short, but you've also got a long-term policy. To be clear, I was not part of the Alliance of civilization's effort, so I'm standing a little bit aside from these two who very much were part of it. Um, first comment 
uh, is that this is an important report uh, because it it's one of the very few efforts that operates at the very highest level. It's high as you can get in world government responding directly to the Secretary General of the United Nations. Uh, and it is also a topic, uh, a report on a topic of absolutely critical importance. In that sense, it's interesting, ironic, and rather sad how little reaction and comment there's been on that on the report so far uh, in, in a global sense. There have been reports on it and commentaries, uh, but it certainly hasn't been front page of the Washington Post or the New York Times. And I think it's worth us reflecting on that. I had wonderful people on it, a whole series of remarkable, very diverse uh, people who made up this high-level commission. And it is clear that it will have a lasting uh, impact on thinking within the broad United Nations system as well as uh, in the broader, broader public opinion. But I, I do want to come back in a minute to how difficult it is to communicate thoughtfully about these very critical issues uh, that face us uh, in the world today. Uh, because it, that, well, that, that, let me go back to the starting point, which I think has been touched on here, uh, but not necessarily uh, made explicit, that we are talking about a, an evolution or a continuum or a distinction uh, between the rather sticky difficult and problematic concept of the clash of civilizations of uh, Huntington, which evolved in an, in an interim stage into a push for a dialogue of civilizations, and then in this case, an effort to talk about an alliance of civilizations. So I think that that, that continuum is an important one uh, to reflect on. Uh, in many senses, and, and this I want to underscore what both Shamal and, and John have said, uh, this report is set against the backdrop that we live in what you might call the best of times and the worst of times. Uh, we live in a world of extraordinary hope, uh, of uh, dynamism, creativity, uh, where everything seems possible. Uh, but we also live in a very dangerous world uh, where there is a rise uh, to those of us who work in the international world that a sharp rise in tensions. Uh, it's a situation that, that is possible sitting in Washington or in the United States not to be aware of. Uh, but when either you read polls or when you uh, travel and operate in different parts of the world, uh, the perceptible change within the past decade uh, is quite dramatic. Uh, one of the, uh, Shamal made the link between the broader tensions about the role of the United States, uh, the wealthy countries, the rich versus the poor, uh, the issues of globalization and the issues of Islam, which I think is a very important and complex set of relationships. Uh, you will recall that six, seven, eight years ago, there could not be an international meeting without large protests, uh, barbed wire fences, uh, chain link fences around almost any international meeting in a sense uh, that uh, forces uh, opposing globalization have come together. It's interesting that this is not the situation now, uh, that the uh, global uh, uh, movement, the anti-globalization movements, have taken very different forms and have mutated into different forms, including some of those uh, that, are, that are an issue here. Uh, but it would be, I think, a serious mistake to become complacent and to think that the issues and the concerns and the anger and the, uh, the sense of disorientation uh, in this world of rapid change where there is so much uh, challenge to traditional uh, patterns and views all over the world has gone away. Uh, and we are seeing, I think, this sense first of the of the unease and resentment of the uh, power of the what's called in many cases the unit power, the worst use of the word empire is very frequent in many settings, uh, and the ties of that to uh, to this sense of, of social lack of social justice 
and a lack of fairness uh, within, the, within the world systems. Uh, the, uh, let me comment, I'll make a few comments on the report reflecting both my own reading, uh, but also some of the comments that I've been able to glean from others. Uh, first, um, the, I, I will not comment uh, because uh, the issue is what happens to it on the very interesting political recommendations which are set out in the report. Uh, the call for essentially a major new initiative uh, that would address the festering sore of the Israel-Palestine problem, the, the issues of Iraq, we're all acutely conscious uh, of these. Uh, issues. Uh, there's also a very interesting idea of putting together a, a, a very uh, high-level group which would reflect on establishing the narrative of how we have got where we are, uh, which this has been done, the, the proposal is to do it in a different way. Uh, but turning to the bulk of the recommendations in the report, uh, there is an underlying philosophy, uh, which I very much share, that in many senses this is about education, education, and education. That the long-term solution in at least two respects lies in education. That first, it is improvements uh, in standards of education across the world uh, that are essential uh, for success in the kind of multicultural and multipolar world uh, that we think is developing. And secondly, that a much sharper focus in education systems needs to go on these issues of living in a multicultural society with understanding and respect. Uh, and the report outlines an extraordinary gamut from exchanges, use of the internet, uh, development of curriculum, uh, etc., which, uh, which are very much uh, worth looking at. And I would mention parenthetically that these are also the focus for the same reason of the Council of 100, which sees working through education systems from top to bottom as the central part of the long-term uh, solution. So that I wanted to underscore uh, education. Uh, the report has as its central philosophy that it's, it's about politics, stupid. Uh, and uh, that it's much less, even though it's dressed in the guise of religion and culture, these tensions, uh, that it is more about politics. Uh, but that also it has an interesting comment that in our times, that politics uh, and religion have an unusual symbiosis, that the two uh, go together. The report focuses very little on what one could see as an alternative hypothesis, both of the diagnosis of problems and of the uh, lines of hope for the medium to long term future, which brings in economics. Uh, the report has very little about poverty, uh, employment, uh, inequality, and equity as the sources of tension. Uh, it would be my inclination to put substantially more weight in that direction. Uh, poverty and inequity are treated almost in passing. Uh, and as a guiding principle, the report notes that poverty leads to despair, a sense of injustice, and alienation that when combined with political grievances can foster extremism. Eradication of poverty would diminish these factors. And that's about it. Uh, so I think another perspective, another important view, is that unless there is the opening of avenues of hope, which means jobs, which means education, which means uh, health care throughout the Islamic world, throughout the uh, developing world, uh, that it is very difficult to imagine a world where we will overcome the kinds of tensions uh, that we're seeing uh, today. A uh, third comment uh, I would make is that uh, the, uh, the report, obviously, as, as any report that deals with the Islamic world, highlights the diversity uh, of the Islamic world. Uh, but 
the report is very much weighted to what one might call the heartland, the Arab heartland and the countries uh, around it. Uh, the large populations, uh, the Islamic populations of the Far East of uh, Africa uh, uh, are, are not very much touched on, even though they are a very critical part of the Islamic world and one that needs to be uh, very much part of any uh, strategic framework. And the report, uh, as is, I think, uh, the consensus document, which John referred to, uh, as in most of these discussions, finds it difficult to come to terms with even defining terrorism uh, and dealing with the impact of violence, which I, I can only imagine, I was not a fly on the wall, the kinds of discussions that took place, but I can imagine them well because they take place uh, in countless settings. Uh, so these are, I think, some of, uh, a few of, of the issues, uh, but I, I certainly commend the report and, and hope that it will get uh, more attention uh, than it has up until now. One of the issues here is that as soon as something mentions dialogue, and possibly as soon as it mentions alliance, uh, as soon as it mentions moderation, uh, the tendency is for people to snooze uh, and to put that report aside and to look for something that's a bit spicier. Uh, and this is one of the major issues uh, that's involved. Uh, there is an absolutely extraordinary array of efforts in this city, in this country, uh, in Morocco, in Indonesia, in Malaysia, uh, in China, in India, in uh, Israel, uh, in uh, Brazil, uh, working at to advance interfaith understanding, to uh, learn about other religions, to uh, work on establishing common ground and addressing problems. There are interfaith alliances, there are dialogues, uh, etc. Uh, one of the central issues is that very little is known about these. Uh, there's no common clearinghouse or uh, a perspective. Uh, they, uh, they tend to be presented in very different ways. And an effort in which Georgetown will be involved through uh, our membership of this Council of 100 of the World Economic Forum is an effort to pull together a database, a data bank, about the efforts at interfaith understanding, particularly involving the Islamic world, to try to highlight uh, some of the uh, range of activities uh, the experience that's been gained, and to draw from that a constructive roadmap uh, as we look to the future. Uh, this Alliance of Civilizations report very much highlights and, and underscores the importance of doing this and of, of trying to take what sound like benign words of uh, alliance and dialogue and turn them into the kind of understanding that is needed to see that these are the alternative to violence, these are the alternative to tension, these are the alternative to stalemate, uh, is to invest in a very wide range of instruments that will allow uh, the kind of understanding, uh, respect, appreciation, and thrashing out of difficulties uh, that are so clearly needed at every level from the United Nations system to the United States in its relations with other countries, within countries, within cities, within communities, and even within families. So I think this full gamut of efforts, uh, which I, I do not hesitate to call dialogue, because I see dialogue as meaning an openness to transformation, a sense of curiosity, a willingness to learn, a willingness to change, uh, that, that is a, a vital element in the dynamic uh, world in which we live.
uh, we might be able to give them more efficiently by taking uh, maybe two questions at a time uh, and then having uh, a response from uh, members of the panel. Channel uh, suggested three, uh, but that's very Trinitarian, and I just want to be enforcing our common identity on the other So, uh, if anybody would like to, if you could just go to the, uh, to the microphones. Uh, and yes. Thank you. Uh, can I have a comment before I have a question? Got to be really, really brief because we have a limited amount of time. And um, uh, I should forewarn everybody that I'm known for being a nasty chair on this kind of thing. So uh, it, 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 it's very, very brief. I know you very well. It's easy to see. My impression is that uh, the report, although I haven't had to get this, from your uh, presentations, suffers from uh, one of the shortcomings that we've seen in, in such uh, reports earlier, and that is uh, dealing with the Western world and the Islamic world as monolithic structures, as if they are united, they are the same, they are homogeneous, and so on and so forth, and we all know that that's not true. Uh, uh, secondly, uh, I'll take up Catherine's uh, point that it is concentrating too much on the Arab half time of the Islamic world rather than the rest of the Islamic world where you can go to the The third is this question of double standard. The problem is that the, the West suffers maybe in applying the policy of double standards, but in the, in the Muslim world, the majority of the governments are, are applying multiple of double standards, not only. Then the question of the conflict, the nature of the conflict. And so now we have your question. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, and, and this was this, that the main conflict is between the Western world and the Islamic world in general, rather than at the level of government. Uh, it's not maybe at the mainstream of political Islamic movements, and maybe at some grassroots, but the majority of these Muslim states and governments are Western. Uh, well, I'm not going to read from the report, but it, it, I encourage you to look particularly the first three to four pages of the report. And the, the issue of uh, he's not being modeled against it, I think is dealt with very directly. Um, it, it, the problem might have been in how I was speaking about things, but I think the point is made very clearly. I think the, the John might want to make a point about this, given that he was a high level group member, but the Arab world focus, I think, was. Was, was aware of it. Um, uh, the group was tasked with something very specific, which was looking at the root causes of extremism in this relationship. And I think the group identified that many of the political actions and political policies that were fomenting extremism were playing out in that region, uh, not exclusively, but, but primarily, for better or worse, that's what was identified. Uh, and the double standards point was actually made as well. It says quite explicitly that many, many of the West see double standards on behalf on the part of Muslim leaders of Muslim countries who often tend to decry Western um, uh, actions, particularly attacks on Muslim populations, but rarely decry uh, the attacks of fellow Muslims on Muslims and it identifies those we share attacks and, and others. So, so it, it points out sort of double standards existing and that the fact that those double standards exist on both sides is largely one of these kind of suspicion of one another. Um, but I, 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 I said I would take two questions and I didn't, so what did I follow what I said, so we'll go here and then here and then we'll have a uh, John, you talk a lot about the uh, narrative of the war on Islam, but you don't talk a lot about the other narrative of the Western view of the clash of civilizations that uh, Bernard Lewis talks a lot about, of how these events are perceived through their extremist eyes and how to counteract that narrative. For example, you let me list a few events. Um, Iran wanting a nuclear bomb and pledging the destruction of Israel. Um, the connection between the uh, Muslim Student Association and the Muslim like Brotherhood. Question. Well, I'm trying to ask. No, the I like. No, I'm sorry. I like. You, I think you made your point. Now, if you could bring it and, and make the question. All right. Clear. How do we address this narrative, and how do we deal with these problems? Because I think they're equally as important as the uh, other narrative of the war in Islam. Kind of uh, spoke to part of my question. Uh, I was also respond also responding to uh, Professor Esposito's 
comments on the class of civilizations that kind of both sides, the West and uh, the Islamic world, have kind of this core group of who truly do believe in the class of, class of civilization, this thesis, uh, even desire that. Is the, are the things in this report looking to strengthen the public body against the poison of these uh, kind of extremists, or are we doing something proactive to, to combat that? Well, I'll let Shabo answer the uh, uh, answer your question, uh, but I would just briefly say that I thought at the end of his presentation he talked about uh, the various practical projects, uh, youth, media, etc. So very clearly that was that's very much there. I mean, one of the things that he said from the very beginning was that we didn't want this to be another report that was simply archived, and that the danger is, you know, lots of people do statements. So what? I mean, you know, there's so many out there. Uh, and, and so uh, I think that that practical side is there. So why don't you answer that, and then I'll get back to uh, I, I think my response to that, and I'll just like that with other uh, members were saying, but you know, the, the, um, the focus on the political was largely by the group, I think, and not from or deny this, uh, because the view was that it is largely these political issues and the perceived failure of the government of any Muslim country really to have any success on those fronts in dealing with Western powers that are viewed as sustaining those political injustices, whether one likes that perception or not, that, that if one does not deal with those political differences, if one doesn't deal with Israel-Palestine, if one doesn't deal with Iraq, if one doesn't deal with Afghanistan, you continue to give uh, the more extreme elements in Muslim societies plenty of ammunition to use, uh, uh, and plenty of justification to say, well, actually, the West is engaged in a war on Islam, and nobody's going to do anything about it if we don't. We have stood up against them in Afghanistan, in Iran, in Lebanon, etc. And I and, uh, want to be careful because when I say we, you know, the movements that stood up against those various things are very different from one another in many of the cases. But the point is, um, dealing with that narrative of extremism that exists in Muslim societies, uh, I think, was very much why the high-level group identified the political factors as primary. Because it's, it's the fact those things don't get dealt with by the international community or by the official leadership of Muslim countries or proceedings being dealt with that, that the extremists have so much strength on their side. With regard to the, uh, uh, the alliance and, and a, res a response to what you said, and then I'll make another comment in response to it. I think the way the Alliance chose to deal with a lot of, uh, with this kind of issue was to deal with the kind of both narrative and account of narrative throughout. Because the idea was that uh, we wanted to set out <coughs> that the fact that there are uh, narratives and counter narratives, and it, and it wasn't just simply put in one narrative versus another. And that, that was reflected not only on the part of members wanting to be even-handed, but the fact that we had members who have a different perspective. We have members who would follow, for example, uh, Bernard Lewis's take on uh, on an analysis of an issue and members uh, who would, who would uh, disagree with that. Um, but more spe specifically, putting the alliance aside, and I'm not speaking now as a member of the group, I think that an issue that we have is not whether or not uh, extremist governments and extremist groups uh, uh, don't exist, uh, so that we're not just talking about, let's say, uh, is there a war in Islam, but, but rather there's also a, you know, a war coming back the other way. Uh, from my point of view, that's not the issue. Uh, that is an issue, but I think the fundamental issue is whether or not that is due to a clash of civilizations, however that's understood, as opposed to a clash of interests, a clash of a variety uh, of things, a clash of political interests, a clash of economic interests, uh, et cetera. I think that's, that's the difference. Uh, okay, why don't we go, I think I'm going to answer here. Yes, you mentioned about that you have studied the American foreign policy of those speaker, and you said that uh, there are doubles and after. But there was a survey in August of 2004. They were trying to find out the sentiments of people in Europe and Muslim countries towards the American foreign policy towards Iran. According to survey 82% of Pakistan, they were opposed of American foreign policy to Iraq, 82 percent. Why is 93 percent in Spain? There are less than one person opposed to it. So they were against the foreign policy of the United States towards Iraq. So I don't think Islam 
have a role to play in this. It is a general sentiment of the people. And the second question is that one of the implementations here is that in the forthcoming session of the United Nations General Assembly, which is the second, uh, 62nd session, there has to be the agenda item on rights of civilization. So I would like to see if there is any progress on that. Yes. Uh, I need to contextualize on the aspect. So just, I, I don't know anything really practical about these issues. I don't study up on like Middle East and what's going on over there. But in a more general sense, you mentioned a lot of things as far as human nature quality, such as resentment and all this other stuff. So I have two like somewhat rhetorical questions. One question. I know, so I'm just going to tell you like, what I see the most important of these things. And then two practical ones I'll follow with. Yeah, sorry, one question. OK, one question. Then. And I, I wrote it down once all the other started. Um, okay, I'm playing devil's advocate, and I see that you're not really shy in hiring this uh, privilege of high level group and high representatives, such as like an administrative body of whatever 20 people. And how does this privilege help your cause um, when you're dealing with um, issues involving politics, power, um, ideas of exclusivity, groups of 20 people? This uh, what was it? Council of 100, and this idea of like being accountable and untouchability as well. Um, would you say that um, this is counterproductive, and how do you recognize that this might harbor or engender some sort of resentment? Uh, on the double standards, the point, I might not have spoken clearly, but the point I was trying to make is that that notion of double standards is a global, uh, largely a global attitude, not just in the Muslim world. That's the global context within which this Islamic Western, so-called Islamic Western issue is playing out. Is that notion in many countries, including you mentioned Spain and a number of others. Um, it's different, in my view, anyway, from purely you know, opposition to a war. It's much more about kind of larger day in, day out international human rights standards, are they respected or not? International law, is it respected or is it not? Uh, and, um, and the perception that if those things are implemented and enforced when they are to the interest of powerful countries and they are ignored and justified for being ignored when they're not to the perceived interest of powerful countries. That's the specific thing on those standards. And that's something well, you know, uh, Archbishop Tutu spoke probably most eloquently on the high level repeatedly on this point uh, and kind of came from the perspective he said having very little to do with the specifically so-called Islamic Western issue, but he spoke very powerfully on this being a very strong sentiment in many of the communities with whom he talks. On the agenda item in the UN General Assembly, I can't tell you anything just, just yet, we'll see, you know, the, 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 we have to give an implementation plan to the Secretary General and he has to decide what's going to do with this. I do know that the President of the UN General Assembly is organizing uh, debates on this subject later in, in this year under this General Assembly session for, for, for discussion on the alliance. Um, and I think it's an excellent question about high level groups and councils of 120. Uh, my office, once the John is voted for, once the high level group was disbanded, we had a low level group party. Um, <laughs> we had we invited all the consultants and all this stuff in, uh, in a serious way. I mean, look, I, I think, um, uh, and that is what we call it, but uh, I think. Um, there are two sides to this. On the one hand, the group uh, it, uh, needs to be taken seriously by political leaders, by, um, uh, by, by uh, established leadership in, in, in the global political community in particular. Um, the value of this high-level group thing in, in, uh, is that the UN has established, the Secretary General has now established on a couple of, on several occasions, a sort of high-level panel that essentially tries to get out of the bubble that the UN is in. I think this city, Washington, is very much in the bubble. I lived here for more than a decade, but so was the United Nations office in New York. And what the Secretary General has tried to do is say, look, I want you to find some of the best minds around the world, people with the most experience on these subjects, uh, uh, and bring them in. And oftentimes they've been called high level councils, high level panels, high level, et cetera. Uh, my hope is kind of the name of this group. That high level group has done its job, it's now been disbanded. There's some members of it that very much want to be involved in implementation. I don't think we're going to be doing a whole lot of referencing of the high-level group in the implementation plan. At this point, it's really looking for what are the organizations that are well-established, engaged on the ground, who feel, hey, we're already doing this stuff. We might not be doing it at the level that, you're, that you all just had this, this year long before the meeting, but we're doing it. But in order to support and link with people who are doing work on the ground, still might first need to establish some sort of a political openness to it. And to do that, I think it was important for the Secretary General to convene this group of people and try and get the attention 
of the global you know, leadership community to say, yes, this is important, and to get governments and multilateral organizations now to invest in this, uh, in this, both financially and with political resources, so that it can go beyond the kind of people meeting in rooms. But I, I take your point very well. Yeah, just to follow up, maybe. Um, well, I know, but I just understand that you don't need to use the word dialogue. And as a community member, sometimes I don't feel like my voice is necessarily heard by those people in high level, whether they play in high level or not. Well, I mean, I think that's a real issue, and I think, you know, frankly, a, a phrase high level group always struck me as funny, but even funnier is we've always referred to as excellencies. And he's the guy that always wrote to us, he said, dear excellencies. And I don't you know, but, but one, of the, one of the issues we, we were faced with and we did try to address was, you know, uh, uh, if you're trying to address issues and issues of, of, of people, how do you make sure that you're, they're represented? And so uh, what did happen was a, a, a cross-section of people were invited, for example, youth leaders and other people uh, from different sectors to come and to, uh, to talk to us. We also had researchers who went out in the field and presented positions back. But you know, I think the reality, I, I tend to be, to be really honest, I tend to be somebody who's very generally very simple about, the, about a lot of these high-level get-togethers. You know, the Archbishop of Canterbury gets together with the Pope, et cetera. But I think it is a kind of multiple process. I think it is a bit necessary. I think when, when, when international groups speak, they play a role. But real change is going to come from dialogue that occurs below ground, you know what I mean, at, at, at ground level. But to be really frank, uh, because Chapman will probably tell you, I objected to the high-level group, and I had an alternative name, but it wasn't accepted. Called God's Guardians. Good afternoon. I would like to thank you for a wonderful and very important presentation. My question is uh, one question, but twofold. Uh, first, how do you see the question of reciprocity with the dialogue uh, within the Alliance Association? And the second part of the question is what are the initiatives um, or what have been the initiatives of the Alliance Association? in regard to the human rights and religious freedom uh, issues in Muslim countries uh, toward, excuse me, towards um, um, religious minorities in those countries. Just to, a uh, recent study was released by the International Christian Concern uh, that top 10 countries in the world uh, that uh, have particularly harsh persecution of Christians have come from Muslim countries. And I would like um, to uh, hear the A historic first. A truly short question. Can terrorism be solved until the Palestinian Israeli question is solved? Good. Uh, when we get to that, it will be a very short answer to a very short question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the question of reciprocity is central, and uh, the analysis in the report, uh, you Take it uh, from, from wherever your perspective is, though it doesn't give it. There was a discussion of the high level group in the first meeting uh, about um, look, let's not seek balance, let's let's seek uh, an, 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 as accurate an appraisal as we can get. That might end up being a one to one look at the past reality, or it might mean there's a lot more going on on this side of things that we need to address than there is here that we need to address. That on the double standards uh, issue, it might be going on on both sides. Um, um, but that on the breaking of international law with regard to you know invading countries without you know international support it might be happening more in one place than another. I mean the group basically said in our analysis, let's not seek to be have a false balance on things. Let's try and look at things as they are and speak frankly about them. Uh, I have looked at I am not a career UN person, I don't really intend to become one of uh, nothing against the UN, but uh, it's a very different place to sit than I'm used to. I'm used to being uh, non governmental organizations that, that, that do you know, similar work, but in a different way. And uh, the analysis in this report from the other reports I've read out of the UN, and most of what I've gotten back to people who, who have been very involved in those processes, is that this has more teeth than many of the reports. And that can hurt a UN report. If you want to get international support from every country, then the way to do it is to defang whatever you put out, because then everybody can agree with it. The analysis in this does have teeth. And some of you have already noted, you know, it sounds like you disagree with elements of it. This is a valuable conversation to have, and I think that part of what the high-level group was trying to do was initiate a dialogue off the table. And although Catherine mentioned the report not getting a lot of bounds, it did have almost a full day of debate and discussion on Al Jazeera. It led the BBC World front page for a full day on the website. The New York Times put it on page two, uh, page one. But there was some discussion uh, initiated. What hasn't happened, Catherine's very right about, is the kind of real bounce that you get sort of out of 
the 911 commission re Commission's report, I think something that lives beyond simply the release. But on the reciprocity question, it's central. Now, on the, but it's not central on every issue. It, 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 it's important to sort of the anchor in on reciprocal action. There are many of the cases in which the technical capacity in the West is higher than a number of, a number of Muslim countries. On, on, so uh, if you're talking about internet access being extremely low in a number of Muslim countries, not from just in the Arab world, but in many common Muslim countries in Sub-Saharan Africa and elsewhere. Well, addressing that, having a partnership between Western uh, and predominantly Muslim countries on expanding internet access in Muslim countries is not going to be a one-to-one -one thing. Uh, there are going to be strengths in the West, the West brings, there are going to be strengths in each predominantly Muslim country that they're going to bring to that partnership, but it's not going to be. The importance is reciprocity and approach. And I think this is what the high-level group tries to do. Oftentimes what happens, I think, is you have a dialogue between people of one side of a conflict that then bring their conclusions to the other side and say, how can we work together on this? Uh, that's not what this report does. The report initiates a dialogue between sort of all sides of the issue and says, what is the problem from your perspective? Let's identify the problem and set the agenda together. And then we'll figure out how to work on it together. And I think that that's important. Now, on the religious uh, 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 sites issue, on the religious uh, freedom issue, it, it is raised in the, in the report. Uh, uh, in, there's a specific thing in the political section of the report on the importance of protection of religious sites, particularly because the desecration and attack of those sites is uh, extraordinarily um, inflammatory for relations. Uh, and we've already seen what can happen just with cartoons or, or you know, with folks' comments. One can imagine how much others think what would happen if either of those events really did disintegrate it into full-scale attacks on churches and mosques and this kind of thing. So the group makes a very strong point on that and says that it's particularly the, the, the responsibility of political leaders to do that. I'll say one last thing, which is that many of the reviews, and I don't know the particular one that, that the young lady cited, many of the reviews of, for instance, whose media is doing what, who's protecting whose religious sites, um, are not at all reciprocal. They are organized in one community to look at the other and not to look at one's own. One thing that the group did say is it would be much more valuable and have a lot more integrity if an organization based in a predominantly Muslim country um, and an organization based in a, a Russian country were to look at each other's media and issue joint reports, or to look at one another's media, one's own media, and issue joint reports, then simply the one-way advocacy that oftentimes happens, because you end up getting a very skewed picture depending on which community happens to be more organized politically of where things are, are, are happening. But that's not, that's not a critique necessarily of the group. I don't even know the group that you mentioned. Um, um, but, you know, the, the Alliance hasn't done anything specific on these things yet because other than the issue of the report, it's now, you know, we need to present the plan to the Secretary General so that she will start doing some things. I'll make just one comment. Uh, from these questions, uh, I think it, a lot comes back to a central difficulty that we're all of us grappling with, which is the huge uh, Islamic world and the tremendous diversity within it. Uh, which makes it very dangerous to go too far down the road of um, generalizations. Most of my, uh, much of my career was spent working on, on Africa, uh, dealing with Islamic communities. The Tijaniya community in uh, West Africa couldn't be more different in its reactions from Indonesia and Malaysia. Uh, and we should never forget uh, that we're not talking about a model any more uh, than the Christian world is modeled when you think of the diversity. There's as much diversity, I'm sure, within Islamic communities as there is within Christian and which you can look at that. Well, with regard to Palestine terrorism uh, and uh, you know, whether or not we can ever hope to fully address terrorism without solving the problem in Palestine, the answer is yes. I agree. Look short answer. Uh, okay, uh, we'll go here and here, and I think that's going to be pretty close to the end. Yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, uh, my question is, one in terms of analytical clarity, I mean, if there is diversity in the Muslim world, what becomes apparent to be the problem in the phrase that we mentioned numerous times that the, the panel is, is Muslim extremism. But I have yet to hear uh, a clear working definition of Muslim extremism. Uh, because what it seems to be is it ranges from the Al-Qaeda the attacks of September 11th to the anti-cartoon protests in uh, the Danish cartoon. And is, is my impression of that uh, definition correct? And if so, 
justify it, and if not, can you clarify it? And the question about the policy, I think it's very good. But, but I, I'm not even sure. I just want to have my oh. thought. Do you see your you know, we define extremism? Well, do you define Muslim extremism? Because uh, both of you gentlemen have used the term Muslim extremism today. Yeah. But I think the term. I never used the term Muslim extremism. Or Christian uh, extremism. Then I might be mistaken. But I think it's the term extremism in Muslim societies. Okay. I well, I, right I would like clarification of what you mean by that and what you, yeah. Professor Esposito, mean by Muslim extremism. Right. And, and if that's shared, that's clear that what you within said, the yeah, view is sure. Okay. Um, and I'm sorry, you only get one. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, my question is about, uh, was there special attention at all given to the role of American Muslims because they are part of the diaspora and have uh, connections with, the, with this entire Muslim world, which is out there very diverse and so on. And, and particularly, I think, given the role that American Muslims are, the position they're in right now, post 9-11, where they see themselves as citizens, they're highly integrated, and yet they feel criticized. I think there's great opportunity there. Uh, and I'll just end with this note. Uh, you should all go to the Alliance of Civilization website and see the, uh, the video of uh, Mr. Idris there talking about the role of youth, because I think it gives you a much different picture in terms of the hope that youth are going to be involved in this alliance in an active way that, goes, that has nothing to do with a high level group. I, just, I recommend that to a few students or anyone who's here. Uh, I think that's, that's something we should all keep in mind, the role for youth. So I guess my question is, American Muslims, their special role, and maybe even involving American non-Muslim youth in, in this as a sort of a civil rights struggle to gain attention to this larger issue. Uh, on the extremism point, just take the site, it's chapter first, but uh, paragraph 3.10, if you're interested in terminology, it goes into fundamentalism, extremism, terrorism, and it says an extremism that it's not good. It is a, essentially advocating radical measures in pursuit of political goals. Now, radical measures could be violent, but also doesn't necessarily, doesn't necessarily have to be violent. Uh, I don't use the term Muslim extremism because I, I just I don't attach in any religious religion to extremism, put the adjective on extremism as if it is a religious thing. Uh, but I do say extremism in, in the West, extremism in, in common Muslim countries. Um, and the group, if you read the report, I think what comes across is that approach, of, that way of talking about extremism can very much be understood to describe government policies pursued both by common Muslim country, governments of common Muslim countries, and some governments in the West. Uh, but it doesn't go into any more definition than that. Um, um, briefly on the point of American Muslim, it's not made the kind of plug into American Muslim communities in the, in the report. Um, um, but I can tell you very much that I, John was a pleasure to work with on this, so this is not said in any way. We're going to, I'm thrilled that this process is over because uh, it was it was very painful, and um, getting a consensus among 20 people is one thing. Now moving to the point of action is what's really interesting to me. And on that front, I think reciprocity, doing things of goodwill, identifying common concerns, engaging young people, uh, because young people are very much. I appreciate the plug. Uh, it's not just this young people are the leaders of tomorrow. I think it really is very much that social change in almost any society you look historic with all the major social movements, most of them have been led by young people. It's not just that young people engage, but oftentimes the change begins on college campuses, youth associations, et cetera, et cetera. And oftentimes the belts come along later and win the Nobel Prizes, but it's young people that actually uh, kick things into gear initially. And so that, that, that's very much the focus of the case. You won't find it in the report. And you won't find in the report a lot of things that I'm hoping to bring into it as implementation phase if we get the Secretary General to um, uh, it's, I gotta be very uh, I, I, I do use the phrase Muslim, Muslim uh, oh, yeah, there they are. Uh, I do use the phrase Muslim extremism uh, versus using the phrase Islamic extremism. To me, Islamic extremism, you put the word Islam before it, then you're clearly implying that it is the religion of Islam. To use the phrase Muslim extremist of uh, somebody who's an extremist and commits this extremism, saying that he's doing it as a Muslim and doing it in the name of religion. Um, I think it's, it's, it's a fair assessment. You know, some people will say things like, well, if you say Muslim extremists, why don't you use the phrase Christian extremists? But, but what is extremism? What, what is the Muslim, whether it's well, extremism in the Muslim world or good, Muslim extremism, then, is it taking, you know, a As a lifelong Democrat, I will respond in the words of a former President Bush. Read my books. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we are out of time. If you'd like to talk to us afterwards.
feel free to come up.